Hello, everybody, and welcome into Senior Living Live. My name is Melissa. We have a great webinar on tap for you today, one I think that we can all relate to, arthritis, what it is, and how to manage it. The very talented Dr. Donald Holman is back with us to give us some tips and treatment options available to alleviate arthritis pain. Now, Dr. Holman will, of course, be available to answer all of your questions uh, today following his presentation. To be a part of the conversation, all you have to do is scroll down to the bottom of your screen where it says Q&A. You can type your questions out there, and I will be happy to read those questions to the doctor at the end of the webinar. Now, just a reminder to everybody that all audio and video lines will be muted, and we expect that this webinar will last about an hour. Dr. Homan, we thank you so much again for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us. The floor is all yours. Oh, you bet. Thank you for having me. Uh, so I'll apologize in advance. We've run into a couple of little technical challenges with um, some of the computer access. I'm, I'm at the hospital, and so we have this kind of a restricted program. So uh, we're going to have somebody help me with the slides. And so I, I appreciate that. Please uh, be patient with me. But, um, you know, I'll just I'll just run through some of this stuff, some of these basics. And then uh, I find always that this kind of thing is always uh, time best spent with kind of answering the questions at the end. So um, we'll go through these kind of quickly. And then if anything comes up, uh, just let me know and, and we can talk all about it when we're finished. So we'll talk about some basic stuff and I'll show you some cases and some uh, some real life examples of people that we've taken care of, taken uh, care of recently. Um, so I'm a board certified fellowship trained orthopedic surgeon and uh, I, that's what I do. I take care of art arthritis patients uh, day in, day out. You know, this is a very common condition and um, you know almost everybody it, it knows somebody with uh, you know some sort of hip or knee issue and so we see these kind of things uh, you know really very commonly and so that's what I do I specialize in joint replacement and so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that I will also talk about how to um, kind of avoid those kind of things if you can you know that's always the end of the line uh, kind of situation for people and so we'll talk about you know, what are your options? What are the things that really work? What are the things that don't really work and what you can do to, to you know, um, uh, keep on the move and, and keep active and, uh, you know, hold off uh, on any of these end stage procedures if, if you can avoid it. And then we'll talk a little bit about some of the specific things that we do relating to joint replacement, whether that be total hips or total knees or partial knees or, uh, you know, what other kind of uh, surgeries are out there for some of these conditions when, uh, people are kind of in this, uh, you know, early uh, uh, period and, and, you know, maybe they're not so far gone that they have to look at a joint replacement operation. So any of those things that are that are questions that you might have, just think about some of that stuff, write it down, and then we could talk about it at the end. Go ahead to our next one, please. So the reason I put this slide in here is that it's important to keep in mind that when, when I use the word arthritis for the purpose of this discussion, um, just remember that we're talking about run-of-the-mill wear and tear osteoarthritis. And this, this is important because it's important to differentiate this from the rheumatologic arthritis issues. So we're not specifically discussing rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis or any of the other rheumatologic type conditions. So when we use the word arthritis, what we're, what we're talking about here is run-of-the-mill wear and tear osteoarthritis. And if that's not clear, we can we can uh, discuss that further at, at the end again, but uh, just keep that in mind. And so run of the mill wear and tear osteoarthritis. This is really very common. And, uh, you know, like we were saying earlier, uh, everybody knows somebody who's got one of these conditions. And, you know, maybe, you know, somebody that's had their hip replaced early on or their knee or partial knee or something like that. So um, this is uh, an, an all too common condition. So. Um, we see, you know, 40, 50 people every day in the office with uh, with these kind of things. And so everybody's at a various stage of the management, whether they're treating their symptoms, trying to avoid an operation, recovering from an operation. So it's it's really it's really quite common. So when we look at these um, patients and we see people, uh, generally people fall into kind of one of these three, you know, sort of classifications or stages. And so, um, you know, we'll see people sometimes in the very early stages and some people have these early stages and they're really very symptomatic. And so, you know, this is why I always tell my patients, this is why we're not um, replaced by computers because not everybody falls into a, you know, very specific algorithm. So there's no one pathway for every person. Everybody's different and everybody's process is different. Everybody's stage of the disease is different and everybody's 
level of symptoms is, are, are different. And so sometimes we'll identify some people in these very early stages and they'll be very symptomatic. And then we talk about, uh, the, you know, the various management options at these early stages. You know, sometimes there are things that we can do to try to uh, preserve somebody's joint very early on if we can identify somebody with one of these early kind of conditions. And uh, sometimes all they need is just, uh, you know, to know that they're going to be okay, to know that they don't have some, you know, horrific, catastrophic problem. And uh, they just want to make sure that they can, you know, get back on track and, you know, continue to live life. And so, you know, every spectrum of that kind of encounter occurs at, uh, at the mid-stage, early-stage process. Um, you know, the mid-stage people, oftentimes these people require a little bit more aggressive treatment. And so these are people that sometimes they wind up with injections. Uh, you know, they usually they have a lot more pain. They're starting to notice that their, you know, their motion is decreasing and they're starting to really change the way they, they live their life. And again, you can have people that have this radiographic appearance, you know, meaning the way the x-rays look is is definitely becoming more um, uh, impressive, uh, but they're, you know, still doing okay. Or, you know, you can have people at this stage that are really having major problems. And so, you know, we tailor the treatment uh, according to where they are, you know, based on their symptoms. And then as you get to further progression of this process, these are oftentimes people that, um, you know, start to have as much a mechanical issue as they do a surface issue inside the joint. And, and what I mean by that is these are the people that start to really lose significant motion. Uh, you know, when you're in your hip, you know, you can start to get uh, such a deformity in your hip that it becomes hard to sit down. And so I know right away when I see somebody who come, when they come into my office and they try to sit down and they, they can't bend at the hip joint, they can't straighten out their leg because they have basically a square peg and a round hole. And so, it, you know, the, the simple mechanics of the, of the joint surface push the leg in, in, uh, in an abnormal direction. And you can see this in people with knees. These are people that start to develop, you know, men more commonly start to get that bowed leg appearance. Ladies oftentimes have a little bit more of a knock knee progression. And those are because of the, the ways that uh, hip and uh, our, um, hip and knee alignment is a little bit different in men and women. Uh, but they uh, typically, you know, will wear the joints in a, in a one or the other direction. And so you, you can identify these people right away and see them walking around and they've got a pretty significant deformity. And generally those are people that have end-stage arthritis of their joint, whether it be their hip or their knee or, um, you know, and that, with that in mind, you know, you can develop arthritis in any joint, really uh, see it oftentimes in people with, uh, you know, joints in the foot, every, every one of your joints is covered with this same sort of cushion. And so you can develop wear and tear arthritis in your low back between your disc spaces in your back. There's little joints in your back that can develop arthritis as well. And those can all go through the same sort of progression. And, and um, unfortunately for, for some of those other issues, there's not as many reliable solutions the way there are in hip and knee. So go ahead on to the next one. So the reason I put this slide in is people always ask me, well, how did this happen to me? And arthritis is one of these issues and it's uh, it's kind of like ubiquitous in in um you know the population but the more we learn about it the more we realize there's there's so many things going into it it's not just you know like wearing the tread on your tire you know there's genetic components a lot of times these people have you know all of their family members have had issues with this you know all well, my mother had her hips replaced and my you know maybe my you know her grandmother had her hips replaced and so everybody's got a hip issue and uh, you know, there's there's definitely genetic components that that can contribute to some of these conditions. Uh, trauma is one that we see not infrequently, and so you know these are oftentimes younger people who will come in and who have had you know a, a hip issue or a knee issue, and so you know they say, well, how did this happen? You know, so early, and well, well, did you think back to when you had maybe tore your ACL and you know had a knee dislocation in essence, and that's what set set the cascade in motion for that person to wear out their knee early on. Infection is uh, not good for your joint. And, you know, if you get infection inside your joint, it can deteriorate the cartilage and that can lead to early arthritis. Inflammation kind of does the same thing. So people with recurrent gout attacks, we see those not infrequently. And so if you have a recurrent gout attack in your knee, you can wind up with a, with a very hostile environment for your cartilage and that can lead to early deterioration of the cushion inside your joint. And then you have an arthritic painful knee that starts down this progressive process. Metabolic issues are common also. And so the more we learn about diabetes, for example, you hear a lot about heart disease and diabetes, but diabetes also can help lead to deterioration of your joint surface. And so controlling your blood sugar can be very important, not only for your heart health, but also for your knee health. And so it's important to have good knee health so that you can keep your heart health healthy. 
Um, and um, aging, you know, if we're all lucky enough to live long enough, we're all going to wind up with one of these problems because uh, we're all just mechanical uh, devices, you know, and we're and we're wearing down with the more steps we're putting on there. And so then on the other side of this cartoon is a nice little picture. So if you imagine that this is a knee joint and that top portion is the femur bone, the leg bone, and the bottom is the tibia. And then that surface in between there that looks all rough and ragged right now, normally there's a nice smooth cushion in there. And uh, cartilage is actually an amazing substance. It's actually slicker than ice when it's, you know, when you're, when you're first uh, developing. And so, you know, when we were all children, we had this amazing surface on all of our joint surfaces that's even more slick than ice. And so you have this pain-free, you know, amazing um, substance that, that cushions uh, your joint surfaces. And so as we all get older and all of these things on the other side of the screen start happening to us, we start to lose that nice uh, super slick surface. And so we wind up with all of this stuff that happens on the other side of the picture. So as the surface gets rough, there start to become cysts inside the bone. And you can see those on the x-ray. The capsule starts to get thicker. That's why people with these arthritic knees, they come in and they say to me, hey, how come this one knee looks different than the other? It's because it's all part of the process. You know, the this is just an organ system, just like your liver or your kidney. And there's processes that go on in, inside each one of those organs. And so each one of your knees is its own organ. And so these are all the parts that are functioning within your organ. And the, as the lining of the joint starts to react to the debris inside the knee, it starts to swell, makes the capsule swell. It's kind of like a feed forward process. The cartilage starts to get more, uh, uh, you know, frayed and deteriorated. And uh, then you start to get these extra bone spurs that start to develop because as the bone presses on the bone, it only knows how to do one thing. It makes more bone to try to decrease the pressure by increasing the surface area. And so you start to feel these bumps that'll start to develop on the uh, around the knee surface. And it's those same bone bumps that start to develop around the hip. And that's what leads to people not being able to sit down, for example, because there's a big block of bone that develops in front of the in front of the neck of the femur when they're trying to sit down. So all of these things are happening inside that organ system. And it's uh, it's a combination of issues that lead to these things. And this is going on with all of us all the time in all of the joints. So go ahead to the next picture. And so these are just a couple of examples of some patients and uh, what this looks like on an x-ray. So when you look at this knee, when you see that big white arrow in the top corner, see all that space in between there. The x-ray shoots right through the cartilage because there's lots of surface, um, uh, lots of space between those bone surfaces. And that's where that nice cushy cartilage lives. And then if you look at that x-ray below there, you see where that bone is touching that bone. And that's where that cushion is no longer there. That super slick, icy surface is no longer there. And so now that bone is rubbing on that bone, and that's a rough surface now. And that's what feeds forward the process inside that knee joint. And then when you look at that hip, you can see the top hip x-ray where that hip looks like a nice round ping pong ball. And that's coated with that nice cushion ice surface. And that rests inside the socket that also has a nice cushion ice surface on it. And that moves around pain-free in a healthy hip and it works really well. Then when you look at that one below there, you can see those extra bones that are growing on the bottom. You can see where that bone is touching the bone because there's no more cushion between those two surfaces. And that's a painful arthritic hip. Uh, go ahead to the next one, that's perfect. So what can you do for your joint health? Uh, you know, the most, the most common question that I get uh, every single day uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, management of my, of my arthritis patients, what are the things that, that you can do? And this is probably followed then by the most common question that I get, you know, well, what kind of medicines can I take or what are the supplements I can take? Or isn't there, a, you know, an over-the-counter pill that I can take that's, that's going to make my joints, you know, healthier and better? Uh, and, and the truth is, is that there's really no overwhelming research that any of those things really do a whole lot for you. Uh, you know, I take care of, uh, you know, patients from India and, uh, you know, they... Uh, they'll come in and say, you know, I thought turmeric was going to be the answer for me. And, you know, now I've got this terrible arthritic deformity. And, you know, unfortunately, that's that's just not the answer. And, uh, you know, glucosamine and, and all of these things that, that everybody's trying to sell you at every vitamin shop and uh, every place that you walk into. The reason that there's a huge market for these things is because there's a huge patient population with these problems. And so everybody's trying to sell you something uh, that, you know, uh, you know, is going to be the, the be all end all. But the truth is, is that there, there's just no easy answer for this. And uh, it, it really comes down to symptomatic treatment. Now, there are a few things that are very research based and evidence um, based that that do make a big difference. And for example, 
having a healthy weight. And this is something that everybody, you know, could, could be better at. I myself, you know, I, I know it's easy just to preach to people, you know, go exercise and, you know, live healthy and lose weight and, you know, uh, maintain your ideal weight. I, I know that that's easier than it sounds. And when you've got a nail in your tire, you know, you've got an arthritic knee, it's, it's really tough to, uh, you know, uh, you know, get out and walk every day and, you know, try to maintain a, uh, as active a lifestyle as possible. But uh, this is one thing that definitely research has shown makes a big difference. And so the lighter that you can be, the less stress you're going to put on those joints. And the one calculation that I'll tell people that I find is really very motivational and people really take this home and, and usually generally will remember this one is if you lose one pound up top, the way the mechanics work around your hip or your knee, that will translate, translate into about five or six pounds less on your hip and knee with each step. And so I've had people that have been ready to have an operation for an arthritic knee. They've lost five pounds. That translates into about 25 pounds less on that knee with each step. And they get to the point of saying, I probably don't need to have surgery. And I say, that's probably great for you because, you know, of course, you're always better off with your own parts, right? So if you can lose five or 10 pounds and that takes your knee pain away for another five or 10 years, you're probably doing the best thing for yourself for the long run. So weight loss is one that um, definitely makes, uh, makes a big difference. Uh, lots of research that supports that in the event that you do need to have an operation. If you're lighter going into it, you're going to be safer. It's going to be easier for you to recover. So, uh, you know, these are these are things that there's, uh, you know, compounding benefits to uh, staying uh, staying healthy in the in the ideal weight range. You know, one of the things, too, as your joints will become um, uh, more arthritic and if they start to become more painful, then you'll start to want to try to not move them as much. And, and it's kind of a natural process. You know, you'll, your your knee, for example, will want to start to bend and, and uh, re, you know, kind of contract a little bit. And so remaining limber is is uh, is a good thing for you. And uh, just, uh, you know, the motion of the joint itself is actually what feeds that organ. And so, you know, the uh, increasing your, uh, you know, your range of motion and remaining flexible, those kind of things, they, they certainly can help you and uh, certainly not going to hurt you. And so this is also another just, you know, activity that you can incorporate that certainly can't hurt your process and uh, and can only help you. And so that's just a cartoon that I put down there in the corner that I that I think is always, um, you know, really helpful in the explanation of this because it sort of shows you the progression. So you can imagine on one side there, that's the early disease state. And then as you go all the way around the horn there to the other side of the knee joint, you can start to see what an advanced uh, wear and tear process kind of looks like where the bone will actually wear through that cushion. And that's where you start to see the bone to bone changes. Go ahead to the next one. And so, you know, low impact exercise, this is one thing that I start to talk to people about because, um, you know, it's easy for me to say, oh, yeah, go do this, go do that. You know, uh, you know, you, you know, um, sure, you've got a problem, you know, start exercising. But, you know, what can you do? Well, um, you know, you got to figure out some way to keep moving, to keep flexible, to keep the motion going, but also not torture yourself. You know, so I don't encourage people with these arthritic knees to go out and take up marathon running. You know, that's not going to be a good thing for your surface. And so you've got to figure out a way to keep moving, to keep that pumping action of the joint happening, but also in a way that you can tolerate doing it. And so oftentimes we set people up with pool therapy or we, uh, you know, talk to them about changing their, their you know, activities. I mean, I myself, I have, a, I have a bad knee myself because of an injury early on. And so I used to love to run. Well, now I can't run. So now I ride a bike. Do I like riding a bike? No. But... It's it's just, you know, the the uh, you know, the, the compromise you got to make to keep things moving and keep things going. And so uh, we, we kind of help and, you know, work people uh, work with people to help them tailor the uh, activities that they're going to need to try to maintain, a, uh, you know, as active a lifestyle as they can so that they can get as as far as uh, out of those, you know, arthritic hips and knees that they can. Uh, flexibility, working on that stuff, you know, like we were talking about, all of these things are are helpful. They can help. Uh, you know, take some stress off of, uh, of an area that might be compensating for something that's bothering you. And so just for your overall well-being, these are things that um, certainly won't give you any, any, it won't make you any worse, can only help you. Go ahead to the next one. You know, this is another one that uh, I, I see lots of people with, uh, you know, really bad hip issues and spine issues. And so oftentimes just addressing some of the, the things that you'll notice that are that are compensating uh, from the hip pain, uh, this can then make your back hurt. And so, again, these things kind of feed forward. And so if you're modifying something, if you're trying to splint something or, 
you know, you have, uh, you know, hip issue that, uh, you know, is, is making your back uh, out of whack. Uh, I see people very commonly with these kind of things. And so this is one of the things that we, you know, routinely will set people up with therapy to try to help you identify some of these things, because you can, you can correct a lot of these ailments with just, you know, core strengthening and, and identifying some of this stuff, you know, uh, the take home from this is certainly not everybody needs an operation. You know, this is, uh, these are just the things that we do to help people figure out, you know, where the problem is. What is the problem? Is there something we can do for you to, uh, you know, get you back on track without actually having to do something to you? And so this is just another one. You know, it's very common that you have a hip problem. You're modifying the way you're walking because of the hip starts to make your back hurt. And you can you can imagine the uh, feed forward mechanism there where that starts to spiral out of control. And so a lot of times we will uh, get people back on track with just, a, you know, a simple therapy visit. So. Very common, very common scenario. You know, uh, like we talked about, you know, diet and overall well-being, all of these kind of things. Um, you know, is is having a, a diet uh, going to you know cure your your arthritis? I mean, the, the short answer for that is I don't think so. Uh, but there is a lot of interesting research around you know eating certain things, and uh, you know some people uh, seem to tolerate a, a you know a diet better than others, and so. Uh, I'm certainly not a dietitian, uh, but I can certainly tell you that, uh, you know, this is a big part of the overall big picture for people. And so maintaining, you know, uh, you, know, uh, you know, bone health and identifying whether or not you need vitamin D to be supplemented in your diet and making sure that your thyroid is functioning and all of those kind of things, you know, I will also see people, you know, oftentimes that, that you know, they have a metabolic issue. Uh, that we will identify and have to send them back to their to their primary care doctor because they need a, a metabolic workup and it's not necessarily that they have an arthritic issue. So these things are not uncommon. Uh, you know, and just another, you know, just a simple, you know, uh, all of that fluid that you need, uh, you know, the lubricant inside those knee joints, you know, it's got to come from somewhere. And so just being mindful of these simple day-to-day -day kind of things, I think these things are, are helpful. And um, so just the simple stuff. These are the things that actually work. And I put this in because uh, I get the question very commonly about, should I be just be taking some supplements? And so when, when you're talking about vitamin D and some of these other things, these are fat soluble supplements. And so, you know, you need to have uh, somebody with a big picture medical kind of um, overlook on your whole situation. And so I don't encourage people just to start doing heavy supplement loads just because uh, you know, they, they think they may or may not need something like that. I think it's a, it's a good discussion to have with your primary care people just so that they have an idea of where you're at. Maybe you need some testing to identify a deficiency or something along those lines. And so I guess that my, my hope and my take home from this would be, I, I, I just don't want people to start taking supplements just because. So, um, there is a role potentially, but you just need to make sure that your, that your medical provider, uh, has that in mind and, and has a, um, um, big picture strategy for you and make sure there's no potential interactions or, or that you're not going to potentially hurt yourself with any of these things. Braces can be very helpful and are very common. Um, you know, when it comes to braces, especially around knees, I mean, it's almost impossible to brace your hip, but when, when it comes to your knee, uh, you can um, oftentimes offload a compartment, uh, sometimes very effectively with a brace. And so what I tell people when it comes to braces for arthritic conditions, it's really just a trial and error kind of thing. And so if sometimes people are made better with just a simple sleeve, that's great. It's like five dollars. You get it at the, at the you know CVS. Some people need a little bit more of a robust brace. And so if that if that helps keep you going and keeps you moving and, um, you know, helps you be you know less painful. Uh, I, I do not uh, discourage these things at all, especially around the knee. It can also be very helpful around the ankle, too. Sometimes we'll see people with ankle arthritis. And so. Uh, just a simple lace-up brace sometimes can be very helpful. So then, uh, you know, I guess the next you know, kind of progression and uh, the things that you could consider would be injections. And so if you're uh, becoming a little bit further along the spectrum and, you know, let's say the brace is no longer working for you or you're considering an injection, there's a couple of different kinds of injections that can be helpful. You can try um, uh, these uh, gel injections or these are the People refer to them as uh, the hyaluronic acid injections, or these used to be made from the rooster comb. You'll, you'll hear those uh, terms all describing these kind of injections. And so, you know, these can be these can be helpful. Some people seem to respond really well to them. Um, some people not so much. In full disclosure, when it comes to the gel injections, there's not a lot of overwhelming research that says these do a whole lot for people. Um, and so I make it available and I offer it to people, but uh, with that with that disclosure. So some people seem to respond very well to them, others not so much. 
And then it gets into these other uh, kind of the other realm of the injections. And these are all things that I think really kind of fall into the experimental category. And so like the, you know, the amniotic injections uh, or even stem cells, uh, there's not a lot of real research that says those things can do a whole lot for you. And I think that's really something that's really in its infancy. Uh, do I discourage people from trying those? You know, I, I do not, but it's just, um, um, I, I think there's a lot to be learned still about what's going on there. Uh, now, when it comes to the platelet injections, platelet injections and PRP is the other, the other term you'll hear that describes these. This is quite a bit further ahead in the research, uh, sort of establishing the role and where I think this fits in for people, uh, go ahead to the next slide. Where I think these platelet injections fit in for people is in the very early stages, because there is some encouraging research that shows that some of these things can be helpful in kind of the repair process. And so, you know, um, again, I, I don't encourage or discourage these. I just let people know that these are an option. One of the things that you have to be aware of when it comes to these injections is that uh, insurance doesn't support a lot of these things right now. And so uh, insurance will always allow you to have a steroid injection. You know, it's a routine kind of thing. We do that in the office routinely. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, they push back against us even for the gel injections for the reasons that we discussed, you know, they and they have a they have a valid argument that why should they provide something that that doesn't seem to really help in the research. Uh, and they make the same argument when it comes to the platelet injections or the stem cell injections and uh, so I can understand that side of it, but the hope is with the platelet injections is that if you can identify people in the early part of this process that you spin down these factors off of your own platelets and you inject them back in there and then uh, your knee joint knows what to do with them and starts to repair your your area where you're wearing your cushion uh, and that that potentially makes a lot of sense. It'd be really nice, uh, but there's a lot to be learned about this and uh, go ahead to the uh, next slide. The one thing about the platelet injections in particular is that there's many, many different preparations. Uh, it's kind of unpredictable with what you're going to get off of the platelets to some degree. How much do you need? Uh, how much blood should you get? You know, all of these things are uh, are still kind of questions that are that are yet to be answered. And so, um, more to come is uh, I guess is the uh, is the take home message there. It's not unreasonable to consider them, but um, there's there's much to still be learned in that realm. And so then we get to people that have tried everything. They tried braces. They tried injections. They, um, you know, can't just can't take it anymore. And they get to the end of the rope. And so, uh, you know, surgery uh, is a is a very reliable, you know, very successful operation when it's done for the right reasons. And that's pain relief. The reason to consider any of these operations isn't to make you a marathon runner again. It's to give you, uh, you know, a nice straight leg that you know bends well and pain free that you can live life with and do the things that you need to do for you know, daily living. So exercise and, you know, those kind of things, but it's not a performance enhancing operation. You know, the reason to go get your partial knee replacement is not to, um, you know, get back on the, uh, you know, the Olympic track team. Uh, and so I will, I will warn anybody, we're going to have some pictures of some uh, inside the uh, body kind of um, arthritic conditions. And so they're not super gory, but I, I've been warned before that some people find these pictures um, a little bit sensitive. And so, just uh, be prepared for that. If you're if you're afraid of looking inside somebody's knee, then you might not want to look at the next few slides. Uh, but go ahead to the next one. And so then, you know, surgery options are uh, uh, you know total replacements. Sometimes partial replacements are an operate are an operation that are very successful and is an option. Uh, and sometimes um, you know there are even smaller procedures that we can do that can uh, kind of fall into more of the preservation kind of uh, style. So go ahead to the next slide. So it, let's say your hip is you know worn down badly. Um, you know, your round ping pong ball no longer looks like a ping pong ball. It's starting to look like a mushroom that's been stepped on. Uh, so, you know, what do we do for a hip replacement? Well, this, this cartoon sort of shows you how you take that socket that no longer is uh, a nice smooth, um, uh, you know, hemisphere for that ball to rest in. And then we reshape that titanium shell will go in there. We'll take that arthritic ball and neck out of there. And then we put a new ball and neck in there that rests on a new stem. And that damaged portion of the hip is now out. And then you get a nice smooth arthritic articulation again. Uh, so this is a little bit more involved than just this uh, just this cartoon, but this is essentially the, the take home message is you take a rough surface out that's deformed and, and grinding and we replace it with a nice smooth surface that uh, will now be pain free and you know, improve your motion and uh, allow you to live life without uh, the misery of hip pain. Go to the next slide. So 
sometimes in the knees, you'll, you'll wear only one compartment. And so there's three compartments that are inside the knee. There's a medial compartment, there's an outside compartment, and then there's a kneecap compartment. And so some people, depending on the pattern of a problem that you have, you'll wear only one of these compartments. And so uh, it's nice when that's the case, because you can do a smaller operation for these people when they get to the end of the rope. And it's an easier operation for them to recover from because it's a smaller surgery. Uh, you know, they, they bounce back from that a little bit faster. And uh, it's, uh, it's just easier for people to recover from, you know, half an operation as opposed to a full operation. And so uh, uh, partial knee replacements, they work really very well. Go to the next slide. And I find that people are really very happy with these. And why is that? Because if you've only worn the inside portion of that knee, why would you go and have the rest of that knee taken out? You don't, you don't want to do that. You don't go to the dentist and have uh, all of your teeth taken out if you've got one tooth that needs a root canal. Uh, and so this is kind of akin to the same uh, sort of philosophy. And so um, partial knee replacement is a, is a hard operation to learn how to do well because it's, it's very unforgiving. And, uh, but it works really very well uh, when it's done well. And part of the reason why people are really happy with it is you see in that cartoon where your ligaments are still intact and are still there. And uh, that's what uh, I think is really the big key with partial knees is that you get to keep both of those ligaments functioning the way they do. And those ligaments, they serve a purpose. They talk to your brain and uh, your brain likes to know where your knee is based on what those ligaments tell them. And so it's, uh, it's a good operation when it's done for the right person and uh, when it's done well. And you can do that in any compartment of the knee, whether that be the kneecap compartment or the inside compartment or the outside compartment. And so when you're looking at this picture here, this is a patient's knee, this is their left knee. And so you can see they have the knee bent up there and that's the end of the femur. And if you look really close there, you can see there's a dark yellow area of exposed bone. And there's even red stripes that are in there. That's bone on bone arthritis in the inside portion of that knee that is so irritated and worn that blood is leaking through the end of that bone. And then when you look up and to the, toward my finger, do you see how there's a nice smooth surface there? That's the kneecap portion of the knee joint. And there's nice smooth cushion inside that kneecap joint. So this person, you can see it in the x-ray, they've got a worn down inside portion with bone on bone arthritis that's actually bleeding, it's hurting so badly. And then you look to the kneecap joint and the kneecap joint looks absolutely perfect. And you can see on that x-ray that the outside portion of that joint looks absolutely perfect. And so this is a lady, we did a partial knee replacement for her. Go ahead to the next slide. Uh, she, you know, recovered from this really very quickly. We do these as a day surgery. People are home the day we do it. Uh, she's, uh, you know, I, I did this years ago. She's gone on to do unbelievably well. Uh, uh, you know, we just check on her every year just to make sure everything's coming along okay. Uh, and uh, the rest of her knee is holding up just fine. She's not having any trouble. And, uh, you know, she's, you know, just back to life and um, no longer has that the end of that bleeding bone driving her crazy every day. Go ahead to the next slide. And so uh, what about a, knee, a full knee? Well, a full knee replacement is not, is not you know, it's not uh, wrong to do that. Some people do wear out all of the knee and they don't all of the knee to be resurfaced. But what I think is important to understand is that it's not as though we chop out the knee and plug in a knee. So really all a, all a replacement is, is just a resurfacing of the end of the bone. And so uh, you know, there's really only about eight or so millimeters of bone that come out on each side of the uh, of the joint. And uh, we just, you know, we trim the bad stuff out and put a nice smooth surface on there. And so a full knee is really just a bigger cap that goes on the on the end of the surface. And uh, whether or not we need to address the kneecap joint, that that is a um, determination that is up for debate in the knee world. But most people have uh, symptomatic knee kneecap arthritis as well. And so uh, a small portion of the kneecap will be resurfaced as well, but you keep the, the majority of your kneecap. Go ahead to the next slide. And so this is just an example of somebody that needs a full knee. So, you know, if you remember what that other knee x-ray looked like, that was a pretty, you know, well-aligned, normal looking knee. And so this is a knee that is worn so badly and that the knee is just, you know, looks, doesn't even look like a leg, right? You wouldn't even know what this is. Uh, but this lady was just, you know, tough as nails, lived with this for years. She worked on a farm and uh, you can see there that that's not gonna, a partial knee is not going to solve that problem, right? This is a bad deformity and it's a badly worn knee. Go ahead to the next slide. And so, you know, uh, we, we got this lady straightened right out and she went on to do really quite well, uh, really very quickly because honestly, I don't know how she lived with the, with the leg the way it was, but uh, go ahead to the next x-ray. So, you know, this is an example of a knee replacement. 
this is a little bit more of a robust reconstruction than you might require in a routine setting, but this lady had such a significant deformity that she needed a little bit extra, but uh, you could see, uh, you know, how, how quickly she regained her motion and how happy she was and uh, made a big difference for her. And we continue to just keep an eye on her every year just to make sure everything's come along okay, but she's done really quite well. So she, you know, had a you know huge crazy deformity. Was living with that brace, using a walker to walking in with nothing. After uh, we got her got her back on track with her knee replacement, you can go to the next one. And so, you know, just a, a big part of the program, and probably the biggest advances that have been made in uh, joint replacement have been you know, kind of putting all these pieces of the puzzle together. And so, uh, we haven't made tremendous advances in implants and things like that. We're we're using all sorts of technology now for using the same kind of implants. But what we really focused on now is the management of the patient and sort of a big picture look at how people respond to surgery, get through surgery, and then get back in action as quickly as possible after. And so I work with a team of anesthesiologists that, um, you know, that this is what they do with me every single day. And we're constantly refining the process in the program. And uh, they do blocks that help people go through the process, you know, completely pain-free, I just took care of a gentleman. He came to see me from uh, Los Angeles, California. We did a surgery in Dallas. We had him back on his plane in a couple of days. Um, and he just called me last night just to tell me how much he appreciated the, the whole program and how astonished he was that he went through the whole process and had no pain. And as much as I'd like to believe that it's it's my technique, it, to some degree it is, but it's also the it's the team effort. And so it's my anesthesiologist who does the blocks. It's my team that, uh, you know, just just everything around it. And uh, this is why uh, if you're considering something like this, uh, working with somebody who specializes in this is, um, it, it pays dividends. And so uh, it's nice to have a, um, you know, a little pat on the back from um, a, uh, you know, out of town patient um, and people do, people can do really very well. And so we try to avoid all these uh, heavy duty IV narcotics and things like that. You know, the, uh, the old style of uh, pain pumps and, you know, pressing the button and knocking yourself out and things like that. And then waking up in excruciating pain. Uh, we just, we, we just don't do that anymore. And uh, so, the, you know, the multimodal approach and trying to be thoughtful about all these things, it does make a huge difference. And, um, but it's not, it's not one person. It's a, it's a team. It's a, it's a team approach. It's a kind of a holistic approach that gets people through this stuff quickly. And that's how you do, um, you know, a same day operation with an accelerated recovery. Go ahead to the next one. So if you have any questions, um, I'll stop rambling and we can address any of these things or if any of that stuff was not clear or if you want to talk about any of those things specifically, I am uh, I'm all ears. Great presentation, Dr. Homan. Um, as always, uh, you had that great presentation uh, previously about bone and, and, and joint health, and then of course about arthritis here today. Um, I do have one question here from somebody. Uh, they they want to know um, how do you keep your joints healthy when they are hyper flexible? So that is a really good question. So what I would um, what I would it's complicated because I, I wonder what leads to the hyperflexibility, you know, so if it's one of these uh, genetic conditions that, that can lead to some of these conditions that are, um, that are a challenge to manage, quite frankly, um, it, it, it can be tough because sometimes there's nothing that you can do about that. And so, you know, it's not as though if you have one of these conditions, you're not doomed to have a joint problem it's not necessarily going to be something that will lead to rapid deterioration of your joint. Um, but I, I have seen people that, that do have some of these genetic conditions that lead to some of this hyper, uh, hyper flexibility, and that can lead to, to some problems. And so if you are becoming symptomatic from this hyper flexibility and you do have one of these conditions, I do think that those are people that benefit from brace management and probably brace management early on. Uh, these are also people that, um, um, I encourage them very early on to really work with a therapist and identify any kind of weakness or something that you can do to kind of counteract some of that. Because um, if these patients who have these genetic conditions do wind up needing surgery, they are also people that can have, uh, they can be prone to complications because of that underlying condition. Uh, so we, we tend to uh, try to, you know, point them in the direction of, uh, some of these non-surgical kind of um, um, early intervention, strengthening, you know, bracing programs, those kind of things, depending on what the issue may be. Uh, Melissa's having some issues with her internet, but we do have another question here for you. 
Um, are there surgical options for people experiencing multiple joints that are affected in the hands or feet? The short answer to that is yes. So in the hands, um, there are even little tiny little joint replacements that you can do in the, in the hands. It depends on which fingers are giving you the problems. It depends on what joint in the hand is giving you the problem. Um, and so if you're somebody with a bad arthritic condition in your hand, depending on where it is, it, the, the options are different in the wrist. It's different in the joints around the knuckles. It's different in the joints around the fingers. Uh, it's even uh, gets even a little bit more complicated around the joint in the thumb. This is probably one of the more common joints where you'll see uh, issues, CMC arthritis in your thumb. It's hard to open jars, hard to turn doors, those kind of things. Uh, and there's a couple of different things that can go on for this joint in particular. And so that's really uh, the domain of the hand surgeons. And, um, um, you know, they, they treat those kind of things uh, routinely. But there's there's lots of things that can go on. And it just depends on what in particular is your specific issue and where it's located. We have a question from Kay. And the question is relatively mild arthritis, except in my thumb with the pain radiating, radiating up my arm. Any suggestion for very localized hand or thumb discomfort? And I know you were just speaking about the thumb. Do you have yeah, any? That, and that sounds like a CMC arthritis kind of thing. And so there, there is a little brace that's actually very common. Uh, probably if you saw, you know, your local hand surgeon or if you talk to somebody about it, this is probably one of the first things that they would talk with you about. But there is a little brace. It's very, it's kind of like my, uh, you know, my knee sleeve suggestion for people with knee arthritis. Um, those things are usually very good to start with. But uh, one of the challenges is, is that, you know, it's hard to have a brace on your hand, in particular on your thumb. So, you know, while that can provide you with some stability and some support and maybe, you know, you'll get less of that pain from the grinding in the joint, it's kind of hard to, uh, you know, to, to do your sort of normal day-to-day -day functions with that. So, um, you know, the next steps, if you were to go beyond that brace, there are, you can do injections into that joint also pretty readily. Hand surgeons do those in the office pretty routinely. Um, and there are even a number of procedures for that joint in particular. It's a very common hand surgeon procedure to manage arthritis in that joint. Unfortunately, that's a very common location for that kind of thing. and um, It's very painful. Hey, Doc, we're back. Sorry, internet problems today. Um, so I, I have a quick question. Um, can habits sort of as exasperate the problem when it comes to knees? Are there certain things um, of that nature that can make the problem worse? So I, I, you kind of got cut off from me, but I think what you said is if you if you have an issue, are there things that you can do to make it worse to kind of, yeah, okay. So um, take this for example. So if somebody has one of these you know, badly arthritic knees and it's painful and, you know, it hurts you to stretch it and you're, and you're just, you know, it's, it's just easier for you just to sit with it bent and, um, you know, to kind of take the pressure off. You don't see that very commonly. Uh, those are knees that, for example, if you, if you allow that to happen, then your hamstring will start to contract further and you'll start to develop your own kind of deformity. And so the knee should be straight and it'll start to go a little further and a little further and a little further. Well, then what that'll do is that'll change the mechanics on that surface and the bearing surface. And so then that'll start to wear uh, in a direction that you don't want. And so that can kind of, you know, kind of feed forward your, your wearing knee. And so that puts additional pressure in a location that it's not supposed to be on the other portion of the joint, starts to put additional stress on the ligaments inside the joint that are trying to keep you stable. And so th these are just little things uh, that as you start down this cascade, uh, trying to stay, you know, trying to stay healthy, trying to stay flexible, trying to stay limber, um, you know, being mindful of those things, I think it, it can be helpful. Okay. And what about, um, now you mentioned braces, right? That's something that you, you, you say you do recommend uh, to people who find them that they do work. It's say they're exercising or running or jogging. Um, what about insoles or inserts uh, that go into your shoes? Do you recommend anything like that? I know a lot of people use those. Yeah. And that's a, that's a very common thing. And so the, um, uh, the research that exists surrounding these things is not overwhelmingly positive. Now, you know, that just may be that, that there's really no, you know, big motivation to, to demonstrate something like that. Uh, so I think you have to take any of those things with a grain of salt. What I, what I encourage people to do is that, you know, I kind of look at people as, as a holistic kind of approach. And so, you know, it may be that somebody 
has you know some pain in their knee because they've got a little bit of scoliosis in their back and and so you know they feel like they're a little bit unbalanced and they're a little bit off and so if they can put a little bit of a, a lift on one side and that helps make them a little bit more balanced and that makes their knee less symptomatic well then i think that's a win you know so uh, again it's just one of these you know kind of individual approaches um you know these things don't treat the problem uh are they you know kind of masking your symptoms potentially but that's kind of that's kind of the name of the game really you know well, that's what all of these things are you know it's uh, unfortunately there's just no cure for these conditions if we had that we wouldn't need to work <laughs> you'd be out of a job <laughs> right. Right. but unfortunately right. uh, we all do have those issues and and when i i said it at the top of the show that it really does affect everybody um especially when you get to a certain age i don't know of anybody who doesn't have even just a little bit of arthritis uh maybe over the age of 40 or 50 years old um so suzanne has a question here and it's a pretty good one if you had a torn meniscus and surgery in your 70s and a lot of arthritis was there will that naturally naturally lead to knee replacement well, not necessarily. So the the arthritis is still going to be there and arthritis is progressive, but arthritis progresses differently for everybody. And so some people do okay with arthroscopy. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, that's a whole nother topic and, and we can we can address that if need be. But um, and some people are made worse by doing something like that at that stage of the game. And so uh, that's the discussion we have with everybody when they're deciding how they want to try to proceed and what kind of treatment they're looking for. So it's not as though you've just because you've had a meniscus that's been an issue and you've had that scoped, you're not doomed for knee replacement, uh, but it may just be the natural progression of your process that may lead to that. It's possible. Gotcha. Okay. We've got about 10 minutes here before we hit the top of the hour. So if you have a question for Dr. Holman, this is the time to get him in so we can release him uh, to take care of his patients. Uh, we do have a question here from Catherine. Uh, she said he indicated that he would describe the different types of arthritis at the end. Can he please cover this? And doctor, when you do, again, there's a hundred different types of, of, of arthritis. Um, can you kind of describe how um, different kinds of arthritis are handled? I know certain arthritis you can uh, sort of manage and then other types of arthritis, not so much. Sure. So um, I, I think you can think about these things in two kind of broad classes. So there's the run of the mill osteoarthritis like we're talking about. And that's, uh, you know, just imagine your surface on your freeway and, you know, the more trucks that run over it, the, the more, um, you know, potholes you're going to develop on your on your freeway. And then you can think about um, the rheumatologic types of uh, arthritis. And so what happens with these rheumatologic conditions is that for some reason, which we don't really understand why this happens, but some people, your, your immune system decides that it doesn't like your cartilage and it attacks your cartilage. And so the lining of your knee joint, you know, starts to go haywire and, and your immune system uh, it gets uh, all, uh, all spun up and, and starts to destroy the surface of your knee joint. And why that is, you know, we're not really exactly sure why that happens to some people. And so uh, you see all kind of, you know, all along the spectrum of this. I actually saw a lady in the office this morning. She's made it to about 70 years old, uh, but she definitely has kind of a rheumatologic kind of appearance to the way her hips have now worn. Uh, and, you know, she never really knew it. And, you know, the way that she figured this out was that she can no longer uh, sit on the toilet because she can't move her hips and, and it's happening in both sides and uh, it's gotten to the point now where she's really having major major problems with just normal life uh, and so she's been that way her whole life and and it's a, been a slow process and it's just been deteriorating and uh, progressively getting worse and she's just kind of modified her activities to continue to live life and uh, you know finally makes it here you know after 70 years of living this way and then there's even you know other uh, end of the spectrum where you know I've, I've had to do joint replacements and you know for example teenagers because uh, their immune system destroys their joints and they just don't have any other option. You know, the options become really very poor. You know, teenagers don't want to sit in a wheelchair and, and, you know, not move around. You know, they need to have a hip, they need to have a knee. Uh, and, you know, fortunately, these things are becoming um, a lot more rare because the rheumatologic conditions, the medical doctors are, are so smart and, the, you know, the scientists are figuring out ways to to control these uh, these issues and and you know you see people on 
uh, these immune modulating uh, medications that, that keep the immune system under control in people that have these kind of conditions. And so we see a lot less of these things that, that go on in people because they can manage a lot of these arthritic conditions with medicines. And so uh, that whole, you know, kind of spectrum, you know, the whole rheumatologic spectrum of arthritis is, is really becoming um, really successfully managed by, by medicine. Yeah, that's great to hear. And I hope that that answers uh, your question. Um, again, there are so many different types of arthritis. It's just kind of what, what creates the arthritis, what starts yeah. the arthritis. Yeah. So they I only have the same final common pathway. So, if you, you yeah. know, you may wind up with a hip or a knee replacement, but how you got there may be, may be different. That's right. That's right. Perfect. Uh, Lauren does have a question. Uh, I have early stage arthritis. I am active and play tennis several times a week. Fortunately, I have not yet had significant pain issues. Are braces something that you would suggest for extending my active life? Now you mentioned braces and inserts as something that can help with the management, but what about extending out what is to come perhaps down the road for her? Sure. You know, so let's say for example, let's say if you had a medial compartment, like inside portion of your knee joint, if that was where you were starting to wear down and you were to wear a brace that would help offload that compartment and you wanted to continue to do all the things you wanted to do, I do think that that makes sense, that that may help give you some longevity of that surface because if it's a compromised surface and you take some pressure off of it, uh, even if it's just a few reps, you know, it, I think it's still gonna help you. And so I think in that kind of setting, that would be helpful. But if you have a, kind of a you know diffuse arthritic condition that's going on throughout your knee for whatever reason the case may be, um, I don't know necessarily that bracing that is going to um, you know keep you from from progressing. But it, it's very possible that that you may live your whole life you know like that, and and uh, you may be one of these people that this is a, just a very slowly progressive process, and it may not slow you down. Great, great answer. And Lauren, I hope that that helps. Um, and then uh, I guess finally, as we start to get uh, to the end of this webinar, um, can you tell us a little bit more about the management on the back end and how that has improved when it comes to surgery? Because I know a lot of people take um, examples of things that have happened in their personal life. Maybe they had a friend or a family member who had that kind of surgery, a joint replacement surgery 10, 20 years ago, and remembered what that uh, rehabilitation was like for that individual. And so they kind of are putting it off now, fearing that that will be the same case for them. What does it look like now as opposed to maybe 15, 20 years ago? Yeah, completely different. So uh, this is another uh, discussion that I have every day with people. They come in with their parents and they say, oh, my God, we saw our, our grandmother went through this. And it's just, you know, it's a nightmare. And, you know, we've gone so far beyond the way we used to think about this. And our expectations now are so much different. And uh, the management of people is so much different. So it's routine now that I'll do a hip or a knee replacement on someone and they'll be home the same day. And, uh, you know, if you would have thought about that, you know, even five or so years ago, people would have told you that's just crazy. And now now this is kind of, um, you know, just just the norm. Uh, and it's, it's all of those things that we were we were talking about. It's, um, uh, you know, getting people ready for the process up front, uh, you know, really, uh, you know, skilled anesthesiology team that works with us to get people through the operation, uh, the techniques we use during the operation. Uh, all of the technology that goes around it, and then the kind of the combined medical management anesthetic techniques afterwards with the nerve blocks, the multimodal pain management. You know, we attack the the pain process at every kind of originator of pain. And so, meaning that, you know, we, we try to control the nerves, we control the inflammation, we control with centrally acting, we control with locally acting. And uh, then, you know, you put nerve blocks on top of that and like that patient we were just describing who came from California, we just sent him back a couple of days after surgery call, you know, he's, he says, I, I can't believe this. I went through the whole process with no pain. And that's, that's really, you know, we, our, our, our new standard is we have people go through the process and they take only Tylenol for pain control. And we try to, you know, keep people away from narcotics because those are, those are dangerous. They have downsides, they have side effects and they slow your process. And, you know, no, and, and I'm not saying that everybody goes through, you know, and, and is, you know, high five and you know five minutes after that that's you know everybody's circumstances are different and i'm also i also don't want this to be um um you know because people will come in sometimes and say oh well you know so and so down the street you know seems like they're doing you know so much faster or something like that you know it's not it's not as though if your friend is having a problem that something has been wrong or something like that everybody's circumstances are different the reason everybody wound up needing these operations are different 
And so everybody's got a little bit of a different, um, you know, process that, that they go through, you know, getting there. But, um, you know, we, we get people through the process a lot easier now and a lot faster and uh, it's working better for everyone. Yeah, and then finally, we have um, a lot of people who join us on these webinars and, and on the back end when they watch these videos from Texas. So that's easy access to you from there. But um, I know, as you mentioned, the gentleman from California who came to see you, my father who had um, uh, spinal fusion, traveled to go to his doctor. He wanted to be with the best. Um, if somebody wants to travel to come see you or they wanna know a little bit more about your practice, can you give us a little bit more about that information about your practice, where it's at, and sort of uh, the patient flow that you've got right now yeah well we so this is um this is what we specialize in hip and knee replacements uh, we do uh, revision joint replacements we take care of all kinds of um you know challenging sorts of things uh what i specialize in really is uh, minimally invasive muscle sparing anterior total hip replacement and so that's the hip replacement where you do the hip through the front of the hip and uh, we are you know really on the cutting edge with uh, with technology um you know perioperative management and, uh, you know, just really getting people back to, uh, you know, back to action really very quickly. Uh, we take care of people from all over. Uh, it's not, it's not uncommon that we see people from, you know, far, far from even with our state outside the state. Uh, we have, um, um, you know, kind of a, a broad, uh, a broad reach because I, I think we, you know, we provide a, a very, um, um, reproducible product that that I think people are, um, you know, happy to um, receive and, and, you know, go through the experience. And uh, it, it's also important that our, our institutions are very supportive of that. And so, uh, you know, when people are coming from far away, it's, it's as much a logistics kind of thing as, as it is, uh, you know, the surgery is the easy part, you know, so we have to have a lot of support for all of that stuff. And um, it's taken a long time to get to that point, but it's all out there. It's all available. And, um, you know, we receive comments and, and questions and inquiries and things like that through our various websites and things like that. So um, our information is, is available and we have a lot of support for, for the whole process. And that's just the, that's what's key, you know? Yeah. And with the social media aspect too, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Perfect. Well, Dr. Homan, as always, it is so good to see you and it is such a treat for us and for our viewers to have a chance to tap, to tap into your knowledge uh, about uh, this kind of management and, and these surgeries, if those become necessary. Thank you so much. You're kind. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you. Now, if you enjoyed this webinar with Dr. Homan, please head on over to our website to check out another one of his informative webinars about uh, bone and joint health. You can find that at www.seniorlivinglive.com. As always, we thank you so much for being a part of our conversation today. Have a great day, everybody.